Can somebody squish together so we can get a mom and a child together? So don't separate the mom and the child. Yeah. Can, does someone, are you by yourself? Oh, no. Can you sit over there? Are you awesome. you yes. Thank you so much. Right here. You got the red hair and the red sweatshirt. You know, they're not just trying to match. Okay, are we full? Is there any more open seats? We will. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you see best-selling authors standing up? <laughs> Only at a con, man. Only at a con. <laughs> it will be if I fall. Like I'm saying. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about world building. My name is Kiana Kirkland. I'm the editor-in-chief of Delario Press, and I'll be moderating this panel. How this will work is I'll ask some curated questions from here. Uh, our guests here will answer them. When it feels like a good point, um, you want to ask a question, you can get up at any time, walk around, go to the center of this room. There's a microphone dead center. And when I have a little line going and it feels like the right time, I'll open it up to audience questions. So, with that, I'm going to let the authors introduce themselves. Do you want to start? Okay. Um, I'm Kevin J. Anderson. I've written in Star Wars, X Files, Dune, Superman, Batman, Star Trek. Yay! Um, 125 books published and right now. This one is the new Dune novel, Fantastic Dune. It is on the New York Times bestseller list and it's my 53rd bestseller. So it doesn't feel like it's um, And we have a table downstairs and I wanted to tell you how to get there just find it somehow. And we have all, all of our books down there and I'm kind of, I write big science fiction stuff, big fantasy stuff, and I created and destroyed the world. Um, I'm Maisie, I am no author, but I'm also a cover artist and director at Hollowed Ink Press. I am just a general book addict, so saying any more would get too long. Oh, 
Emma Michaels. Sorry. <laughs> and Emma Michaels on Twitter. <laughs> Find the photo she just took. She's all right. <laughs> so, when we talk about world building, yeah. can you give a little basic building explanation world. of what you think world building is and why you think it's so critical for people to be here? Like, kind of like the same about the process? Um, I was, what was the story? I was critiquing a, a Writing, a young writer turned in his fantasy novel to me and said, could I read this and, and let him know what I thought? And of course he had a map at the beginning because fantasy novels are supposed to have a map. And his map had, it was a, a ring of mountains because this land was, was isolated. So there were mountains all the way around it in a circle. And in one corner there was the swamp and then up here there was the frozen waste, and over here there was the desert, and over here there was the, the farmlands, and there was a river running like over here. And I took one look at that map and I said, you don't have a clue about geography, do you? Um, you don't have a swamp next to a desert with the river over there. Um, if you are going to create a world that your characters, your story, everything's going to take place in, there are factors that all go together as to creating your world. And it's not just the climate and the geography. Um, I, I wrote that fantasy novel, not exactly that one, but when I was in high school, I wrote the fantasy novel and I lived in Wisconsin at the time. Uh, Wisconsin is kind of flat farmland stuff. I had never been out of Wisconsin and I had my characters basically journeying across the map and they get to the mountains and I had them get to the mountains, climb up to the top of the mountains, go down to the other side of the mountains, and then go to the Great Plains on the other side. I thought mountains were like in the Bugs Bunny cartoons, like monkey things with snow on the top. I had no idea what mountains were like, how long the foothills are, what a pass was, and all these things. Uh, so what I wrote really sucked, because I didn't know what it was. Um, that's just geography stuff. You have to know things like the, the history of your your culture, the culture of your culture. What kind of music do they listen to? What kind of arts do they like? What kind of education system do they have? Even the, the simplest, do women have equal access to education as men do? Or vice versa? Uh, what kind of government does it use? What kind of money do they use? Are there more than one currencies? There's, there's just so many things that you need to ask before you turn your story loose that sometimes you can get caught up in world building and they never get around to writing their story. The more realistic and believable you can be as a role, the more relatable it'll be for other people. Because we go to school for how much of our life just to learn basic facts about our own world? <laughs> yeah, I mean we spend a big chunk of our life just figuring out the basics of our world. If you don't spend at least a bit of time figuring out the basics for your world and making it believable and relatable, it doesn't always come across. There are a lot of books where the journey is the story, and that's because in real life, a lot of times, the journey is the story. It's making it parallel with reality, even though it's fiction, because even fiction can be honest, no matter what it is. Even setting things in the real world, you have to do your world. You still have to do world. If, if I, for instance, if I were writing a series of stories set in New Orleans, I, I live in Colorado. If I write a series of stories set in New Orleans, New Orleans has has a world that has an atmosphere, it has a culture. Things happen in New Orleans. You can't just look up an encyclopedia entry and read about New Orleans and think that you can capture that right. Getting the broad strokes is easy. But getting the, the, the seven secret spices, that's the hard part. Um, when, I was, when I was 18 years old, I got hired to write a, a pack for a role-playing game company. That was, I got hired by a 19-year-old guy whose name was Michael A. Stackpole. And he hired me to do a pack for his game company, which was basically I had to create a world that they would set their game in. And he gave me the guidelines 
uh, and I remember he had this whole list, and the, the acronym was Persia, like the country Persia. The P stood for politics, E was economics, the R was religion, the S was science, the I was intelligentsia, like education and stuff, and A was the arts. And I basically had to write two or three pages about each one of those topics. And the more that I wrote about politics, it gave me ideas for the religion, because a lot of times religion and politics is interconnected, although not at all here at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, the economics, when you figure out you, and it doesn't, just, economics doesn't mean what's the name of the gold coin that they use. The economics means who sells what, how do you make a living, um, what item is valuable for sale. Um, if you have the, the gold mines that the dwarves are running, obviously gold is, is something. But what do they spend the gold on? Do they want to get food, obviously? Do they want to get... Um, special musical instruments that are made in some village that's up in the mountains, and is that, therefore, that village up in the mountains makes musical instruments, but they need to buy, I don't know, reeds from somewhere. So where do the reeds come from? The reeds have to come from the marshes, which you conveniently drew down on the corner of your map that have you no know, rivers near them or something like that. And if you have that, then how do they get the reeds from the swamp up to this village in the mountains? So there must be roads, and do they collect taxes on it? And um, why do you guys want to get into this? It's just, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to ask the next question again and again and again. Um, I caught myself once, and this is like only really anal retentive or fans would catch something like this. Um, I had a, a novel that was colonizing a planet that was a brand new planet. Life was just starting to form on it so that there were bacteria and stuff and, and maybe small algae on the ground, but you know, not the full ecosystem like we have. And I threw in there that, that there was, they were quarrying marble blocks out of a quarry in the mountains, so they were making blocks and building buildings out of it. Well, do y'all know where marble comes from? Shellfish. Marble is like compressed limestone, which is fossilized shellfish, which I went, oh, you wouldn't have marble on this planet because there were no fossils. Yeah. Look, but that's, that's way esoteric. Most people wouldn't catch something like that. But you do have to think all these details. There are people who catch that. Exactly, there are people who catch <laughs> There are people at this con who <laughs> in normal life, nobody will catch it, but people like this con will catch it. So, I would also say that if you build an interesting world that has enough logic and detail, you've already created a lot of plots and a lot of possible plot twists. And when you think about modern day, why do we watch the news? Plot twist. I mean, that may just be me, but I look at the news and I literally every once in a while think plot twist. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> building. But nobody would believe that. That's the problem. You watch yeah. the news, and I go, "If I wrote this, if I wrote the Malaysian <laughs> Airlines thing, yeah, nobody would believe it." <laughs> <laughs> With modern technology and yeah. Google Maps, how could that happen? Uh, <laughs> if you build an interesting enough world, you've already set yourself up for plots. That's what a lot of people don't realize. They'll be like, "Which came first, to you, the plot or the characters?" Um, aspects of the world, and then I ask, and then you ask the hard question, because you have to think it through. Otherwise, you're not going to be doing your justice, because every book should have, at least to you, a level of depth that you're able to explain to the readers through your writing. Well, and then, like I write the Dune novels with Brian Herbert, and Dune itself is like a character. That planet is so vividly described with the ecology and the, the Fremen culture and, and the spice, the industry that's there and, all, and the weather, everything about it. That is so well developed. That that world is almost like a character. Without that world, just, it drives what happens in the stories. Um, but as a counterpoint, you do have to write your story at some point. 
be one you can't spend five thing. years doing the world building. But the other thing is, every character in your story doesn't know every scientific detail that you developed. If I have a character in the modern day putting a cup of coffee in a microwave to warm it up before he goes out to to do something, to go to, go to his job, that character doesn't put the coffee in the microwave, push the button, and think about the accelerators that are making microwaves that will that will make the hydrogen atoms rub together in the water molecules to heat up the not I don't know how my car works. It works. I turn the key on and I and I go. Cell phones. How, how? Even Instagram. I don't, nobody knows the programming behind it. They just know I took a picture. It's on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Your so, characters are gonna have limitations as well within their world based off what they've had the time and the inclination to learn. Are you dying to ask questions or should we just keep going? I, <laughs> I uh, that's fine with me. I was going to ask a little bit about um, how do you know that you've done enough research ahead of time? Obviously, the research process will continue. But when do you know that, you, okay, I'm going, I'm ready to move on, and set that time to write? I know a lot of people spend, like you said, a lot of their time working on a world, like they're building a game, and then they get bogged down. Um, I usually have to patient. I want to write that story. I, I just. I have to do the world building as a necessary evil before I can turn my characters loose and, and fight the monsters and stuff. I, I usually do science fiction, and I, my background's in physics and astronomy, and I've kind of got a, a, a grounding in that. But I also did a fantasy trilogy, like a, like Game of Thrones with sailing ships and sea monsters. So I have, it's a fantasy version of, of Prince Henry the Navigator and the search for Prester Gemma. Man, was that hard. Just, I, have, I put my characters on a starship and I have somebody talk about use the quantum accelerator and you push the button to do things. But in a sailing ship, I actually had to go, how does this work and how do you sail against the wind and, and how do you tell what your position is and, and wait, where did the rope come from? Did they trade for that or did they make ropes and do they have... Did they have the printing press? I mean, all these questions come up. Do they have gunpowder? Because you just turned the story loose, and I had them with cannons. And then I thought, well, wait a second. Where did they get the gunpowder from? Because I developed my culture that they were isolated. So then somebody had to be, what, the alchemist researchers that came up with it? And, and I decided I like science fiction better because I can just <laughs> talk, talk about the quantum accelerator and it goes. <laughs> hard one for me to explain because for me it's kind of just a sweet spot if you know what I mean. It's kind of instinctual but I would also say it's that moment when you understand that world that you'll be able to give a reader what they need to understand that world. Once you understand it, you can be sort of the translator and guide. But you have to actually have a comprehensive understanding of what you have been creating. Well, another thing that I'd like to add is that, yes, you need to know all the big broad strokes, all the backbone, all the details of it, but when you're writing and describing a scene, it's often the little details that make the reader go, aha, this writer knows this place. Um, I, I grew up in a very small town in Wisconsin. It was called Franksville, Wisconsin. It was named Franksville, Wisconsin because the only industry in town was the Franks sauerkraut plant. And they that meant that the farmers all for miles around, the crop that they grew was cabbage because they grew the cabbage that got loaded onto trucks that went to the sauerkraut factory. Which meant that the sauerkraut factory made sauerkraut all year long. They would process and ferment the cabbage and they they had their canning lines, the production would go all year long. But this is in Wisconsin. Wisconsin gets cold in the winter. It snows, it freezes. So the sauerkraut factory would be dumping all of the effluent waste cabbage water out into the drainage ditches where it would freeze. And then in springtime it would thaw, and then it would rot. And the stench that came out of that, that springtime Franksville, Wisconsin stench from the thawing waste cabbage water made you want to be upwind. And every year, every summer, we had, you know, lots of towns have the carnival come to town, it's the, the 
summer festival or whatever, we had the sauerkraut festival. <laughs> and my mom was the sauerkraut queen of 1957. <laughs> so I've come from royalty. <laughs> and one of the things at the sauerkraut festival was the sauerkraut eating contest. And we had people from around the world coming to have sauerkraut eating contests. That they would have a big plate of it and in 30 seconds they would shovel like two pounds of sauerkraut into their mouths, grab their trophy, and bark. <laughs> okay, the point to that was, did I just describe that world to you? Yes. That was a pretty vivid description because of the little details like the sauerkraut eating contest, like the thawing cabbage water that stinks in the springtime. Those kind of details, instead of just saying, Franksville, Wisconsin is population 250 people and it has cold winters and it is in the southeastern corner of the state. That doesn't tell you anything. It's those details that describes it for you. Now I know what I want on my hot dog for lunch. So. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that using a culturally traditional set of characters makes world building easier? For example, there are rules about certain kinds of monsters, things we all know, um, you know, vampires don't bow during the day, things like that. Does that make that, <laughs> that, make that more difficult or easier in some ways? Oh, depends on if you like it. Because, um, oh, I can't, I, well, I can go to some detail about it without, as long as I don't forget the name. Um, as well as my own novels, I do some ghostwriting. And sometimes that means you're building a world you didn't necessarily feel wrong to. And that's the only experience I've had is something that was more traditional in terms of vampires, werewolves, or succubus in this case. Uh, it can make it easier if you find that thing about it that you find fascinating, and if you make it your own. Otherwise, for me personally, it makes it harder. Because I can't just let my imagination go and just be like, well, all this. Um, I think you have to be careful getting cliches and using the cultural, the vampires or whatever. In fact, most people writing vampires try to do something. Well, my vampires, they can go out in the day, but not direct sunlight, and they, you know, different, different details like that. I worked for a gaming company once they were developing a, a World of Warcraft type type of clone. And I was they wanted me to write the story behind it, the work behind it. And I'm I'm looking at all this stuff and it, it was it was generic with a capital J. I mean it really was there's nothing <laughs> interesting in here. And I met with them, I said, you know, this is kind of my, my problem with this. They're they're just all everything straight from central casting. There there's nothing all that interesting. And the game designer got a little indignant. He said, no, ours is completely different. I don't know how you could have missed this, but in our World of Warcraft fantasy world, our dwarves don't have beards. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, was, that was the unique aspect of it, supposedly. They, they were short guys, they lived in mines, they hated elves, I mean, everything else was, was so generic. And sure, that's a shorthand to say these are elves and dwarves and tell a completely different story with it, but I think you kind of want well, something they, interesting. Everybody wants something. I, I mean, I'm tired of dragons, too. I mean, everybody loves dragons, but, you know, we've seen a lot of dragons. We've seen a lot of vampires. We've seen a lot of zombies. So we want a zombie vampire dragon. And shifters. Yeah, shifters. Shifters is good. So when you're working on someone else's property, somebody else created, uh, how do you enhance that world? Um, and when you start out with, with worlds like you've worked in, Kevin, um, that are very strongly defined, do you receive notes? Do you have, is there a world book? Do you have to stay within certain confines, or does somebody go back through after that? It seems like a really lengthy process. Well, it depends on which property it is. With, like, the, with the Dune books, it's Brian Herbert and me, so we catch our own stuff, or the people who are who are responsible for it. And our our background is the original Frank Herbert material. We re 
we didn't study that, and then now we've done um, 13 books of our own, so we've got a lot of our own canon to keep track of. Uh, in all the Star Wars stuff, it was it was very we they had people who would try to keep track of everything, and I just got lucky because I was early on in the in the process. I don't I don't know how I could write a new Star Wars novel now. There've been like 150 other ones, and I'm I'm sure they don't uh, they don't all match. They're they try to do continuity, but I believe the like the Clone Wars cartoons messed up all kinds of continuity that was in the novels. And now Star Wars 7 is going to basically ignore all of the expanded universe stuff and do whatever they want. Remember, this is the guy who blew up Vulcan anyway because he didn't want to keep it. Star Trek canon, which Star Trek is totally confusing from one episode to the next. I love Star Trek, but there is no way to say this is all consistent throughout. Well, I had seen a part of it. Yeah, but Star Trek, I mean, really, even in the old classic series, you could find one episode totally contradicting the other one. And we don't care. We're Star Trek fans. We would we would go for that. Um, Star Trek, the novels series that they did, they made a command decision that none of their novels was going to connect to other novels. They were all going to be just standalone Star Trek novels. You could go to your bookstore, pick one at random, read that one, and enjoy it. Because basically, wherever it ended was the same place where it started. Like a episode of the old series. That's kind of changed now, but that's different from how the Star Wars people did when they wanted everything to tie together, which I actually prefer, but the problem is when you get 170 books, then where do you even start? Huh? Good luck. So what I would do, well, after I did a few of them, I did 54 projects for Star Wars. So I started going to be, our main characters go off to a brand new planet that I create so that I can do everything I want there <laughs> and then have them go back with me. Uh, do you guys keep notes as you're doing your world building? Um, just to continue to reference, um, if you've made some rule, there is no this or there is no that or there's none of this sort of industry for this reason. Do you write all those things down for you or for your editors, for people to come? Or do you just try to remember them for and I actually have a friend that I occasionally hire to go through and to make sure before I send it out to my editor who will be like, did it again. I have her go through and she, because she's a fan and I'm the creator, sometimes I will create something and I will lose sight of a smaller aspect. Like in Star Wars, Revan was my favorite character in the universe. And in the MMORPG, it ruined his story. And I remember playing it and being like, what? Because every once in a while, it's something that's a smaller detail in an overall arc, but a fan will notice. So sometimes I just have an extra person hop in who is a fan and be like, did I accidentally do any of that? Because, you know. Uh, Fans are loyal to authors. It's only fair to be loyal to Yes. Um, but mistakes do happen. Yes. Yeah. Um, when we started doing the Doom books, Brian Herbert, who is much more meticulous and, and detail-oriented, I have spent about six months compiling a 700-page concordance from all of the original Frank Herbert Doom books. Every time anybody's hair color was mentioned or, or anything, that he's got this massive document and of course, we were supposed to do that for all of our books too, to keep it up to date. And it doesn't happen. It's, that's, I'm, I'm writing the next book. I'm, I'm like, done with that. I'm sure I'll remember it. Well, I try to remember it, but that's what having electronic, thank God we've got electronic files so I can search for something in my old manuscripts. And the problem is sometimes things get changed in the final copy editing process that don't get put back into the electronic file. So I know that it was written this way, and I remember it writing, written that way, but it got changed before it got published, so I'm in trouble. But when that happens, I just say, well, that was Brian's part. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely question. So with all the backlash, well, a fair amount of backlash that George R. R. Martin's getting from, me, from 
for Game of Thrones for being insensitive about the whole slavery thing, even though his world has nothing to do with the, like the real world. Like, how sensitive do you think when we're world building that we have to be about like you know things that happen in the past, like slavery or even like current social issues? It happened. That that's something that a lot of people don't realize. If it actually happened IRL, it's plausible within fiction. And I mean, I would say, no matter what you write, there's going to be people who are going to like it. And there are going to be people who get offended because your main character has blonde hair instead of black hair. I, I kind of akin it to the same thing, because you have no control over what they will find offensive. They could find, you know, a geek girl like me going to Comic-Con offensive because it's generalizing because she's a geek, so she must go to Comic-Con. But, um, yeah, no, I do. It's your humor. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can work. You can, you can worry about all of that stuff and write a book that will offend no one, that no one will read. Um, I mean, I, I, it would be, and I don't, I didn't know the George Martin flat, but the, unless he's writing a book that has portraying slavery as the best thing ever and we should go back and do it again, <laughs> uh, which I don't believe he did, um, <laughs> deal with it. I mean, there, there are, I, I, we can't, we can't write a book where children get injured. Well, I'm sorry, kids get injured. You don't want to make it like, yay, kids got injured. But I mean, that there are sensitive things, and if you if you worry about stuff like that, you're going to be be really kind of crippled. I had, I wrote the Saga of Seven Suns, seven volumes, massive galactic empire, many planets. Um, it's set like 500 years from now, and humans have colonized all these other things. And I have many multiracial characters throughout. And I had a copy editor who went through my entire 700 page novel, and every time I had a black character, she changed it to an African American character. And I went, this is 500 years from now on planets across the galaxy, what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to argue. They said, no, we in-house we made a decision that we were going to refer to blacks as African-Americans. And I just said, do you know how stupid that is? <laughs> I, I understand if you're writing like now and that's what you want to do, but can you imagine a black person who happens to be a British citizen would not want to be called an African-American? <laughs> a Jamaican doesn't want to be called an African-American. Think about the context of your universe. Uh, and I got the, oh, well, if you insist. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that would be low on my list of priorities. Cool, thanks. Hi, Jeff. Um, I thought it might be interesting for a lot of people here to learn a little bit about process. Um, can you talk a little bit beyond research about things that they can do to make their worlds feel real? Maybe literary elements. Uh, I'm one of those people where worlds come to me, I don't necessarily go to them. But then once I'm, okay, what questions do you ask yourself every day about the things around you? Where's the Starbucks? <laughs> <laughs> that aren't Googleable. <laughs> well, no, actually, everything's Google. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> For instance, um, the other day I was trying to sleep and I rolled over and I called out to my friend, why did they call Times New Roman Times New Roman? I don't know, why are you asking this at 2 a.m.? <laughs> and I looked it up and it, there's actually controversy behind the history of Times New Roman. So, I would say you need to get a life. <laughs> uh, I would say just being fascinated with your world and taking notes of the things you think are fascinating about your world can actually be really helpful to expanding your world. If it's fascinating to you, it'll be fascinating to people who read it. Well, hopefully. Um, but also, it's not a I'm creating my world now, and when I'm done with that, then I'm creating my characters, and when I'm done with that, then I'm creating my plot, or whichever order you do that. 
because it should all be this this constant like juggling um, because as you develop your world and you, you like I said before the, the village in the mountains that makes the woodwind or the musical instruments well that gives me an idea for a character who's making the instruments and then another character who is in charge of taking the the yak convoy from the swamp with the reeds up into the mountain village and that guy in the yak convoy should fall in love with the girl who's making the musical instruments and you know then dragons attack and they have to go together and you know the, all of this stuff and then I go well where did the dragon come from and you have to ask that question uh, I did for for DC and Harper Collins I wrote a book called The Last Days of Krypton where I wrote the story of the planet Krypton as if it were a big science fiction epic adventure if it were Star Wars or Dune or something and I said, I know a lot about Superman, I'm a big fanboy, but a lot of these things about Superman don't make any sense. So I'm gonna write a story that makes them all make sense. And I pitched it to the president of DC Comics and we did it. So there's, for instance, if Krypton is the most advanced planet in 12 galaxies, which is established in their, in their thing, how come they've only got one spaceship on the entire planet? <laughs> and why is it baby-sized? Who builds a spaceship that's only baby-sized? And if Jor-El is the smartest guy on the entire planet, how come nobody believes him when he says the world's gonna blow up? And then I, so I'm, okay, so I need to build a world where that answer makes sense, because that answer is in stone. We know there's only one spaceship on that planet, and we know that they could only fit Carlo the baby inside it. So where did this come from? And so I you know, built all that backwards. And then we're, okay, we have to get General Zod takes over the planet, the big uproar, how does that happen? Wait, Brainiac steals the city of Kandor and shrinks it down and flies off of it. Ooh, well if Brainiac comes and steals the city of Kandor and shrinks it down and flies off, this alien has just stolen the capital city of an entire massive planet. That's like 9-11 times 1,000. The social up, upheaval of stealing Washington, D.C. would make the whole civilization go into turmoil, which would leave it wide open for someone like General Zod to come in and crack down. So all these the, the answers start adding up and building your world, and, and it just everything hands off, and it's just a lot of fun. I don't want to say your world is kind of alive once you give it a face. It kind of, it, it grows as the story progresses. Like, if you have somebody watch, uh, I'm going to say the new series of Doctor Who, because it's easier to get people to watch if they haven't seen any. Yay. Uh, <laughs> then a lot of the time they can jump into it. But if your family is like, what's Doctor Who about? Um, I'm going to make fun of alien in a blue box. Huh? I'm a fan and I couldn't give a one line what Doctor yeah, Who is about. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's because Dr. it's grown Who. so much that at this point... Well, sometimes it's horror, sometimes it's fantasy. It's time yeah. travel, it's space travel, it's it's, it's just cool watching. It. It's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know, <coughs> eventually it takes on the life of its own and you just gotta roll with it. Great, let's take out this question. Um, anytime a system of magic or mysticism is introduced in the world that adds a layer of complexity. Um, are there any pitfalls that you would caution in the creation of such a system, or if you've continued in another property um, that was already established, what decisions about that magic or mysticism did you ever find regrettable? Magic needs to be logical. Yeah, it's, it, you're, you're basically it's science. I mean, the ma a you magic system it. has rules. And you need to make sure that there, there are those rules and magic can't be all powerful because it's been a boring story. But you have to define what that magic can do and stick to it even when you kick yourself because you want it to just magically do this. There have been a lot of bad fantasies where the wizard just does whatever needs to be done to save the problem. And if there's no rules, I, I don't know what Gandalf's rules are, but he claims he has restrictions and he just can't do that. Um, I actually don't think Tolkien explained very well what the restrictions were, it's just that when it was convenient to make it a lot more complicated, Gandalf couldn't solve it. Um, 
Um, Brandon Sanderson does really intricate magic systems that he develops, and he's got all kinds of, because he's a gamer, so he's got all kinds of rule books and, and um, detailed plays, but make sure that it makes sense. To other people, it might seem, well, I guess to a hobbit, it seems like this wizard could do anything except when I really need him to do something. Um, he's off at Starbucks or something like that. Um, but be consistent. On Pinterest. Yes. yes. I would also say add limitations. I mean, you don't, like he said, you don't want it to be all powerful because uh, if there was anything all powerful currently, we wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, we'd be, what, what even would we be doing? It would be boring. It would be really, really boring. Like, life itself would be boring if there was some all powerful. Everything's wonderful now. And, you know, also, I don't think that anything great is as enjoyable if there isn't something to let you know that that's something that should be enjoyable. Thank you. Hi. Um, with a science fiction story, I'm trying to build a world, and I'm like, how many of the, I, ju I don't have a huge astronomy background. Um, and I'm like struggling to figure out how many planets I've got to name, and I'm just struggling trying to build it with the planets and the aliens. And I, I mean, I kind of know the main aliens. I don't know if I need to name every single species or advice on that. It would be helpful, please. <laughs> well, name them if they're important. I, I worry when I'm reading things that there are so many names that just fill my, as a reader, that fill my head. I go, man, I don't, do I need to know this? I guess that's your important thing. Do you need to know it or not? Okay. Is, it part, is it important to the story? Um, one of the things you mentioned about not knowing a lot about astronomy, this is one of my big, my big bugaboos when I watch people who make movies haven't the slightest clue about astronomy. And you should know the basics of the difference between a solar system and an interstellar flight and an interplanetary flight. And you gotta know what a galaxy is. I've, I've seen these, I've seen these things where they talk about, and we're flying, across the interstellar distances from Earth to Mars, and we cross the galaxy, and we reach another universe, and then we arrive at Venus. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, there's yeah. Star Trek, Into Darkness. Uh -oh. <laughs> Here we go. This gigantic ship, they're off in the Klingon Empire. They're fighting aboard the ship. They blow up the engine. It crashes, it comes out of orbit, uh, comes out of warp by Saturn, and it drifts and crashes into San Francisco. <laughs> Epic fail. <laughs> it, it would take, at interplanet, at, at impulse engines full speed, it would take them like nine months in order, in order to even get from Saturn to Earth. And this is drifting there, and it happens to just crash into. <laughs> well, and in the first Star Trek, J.J. Abrams movie, when they blow up the planet Vulcan and they get, how was it, Kirk is abandoned on that ice planet with Spock there, but they're flying by warp and he finally gets abandoned on this planet and they look up in the sky and they see this huge planet Vulcan blowing up in the sky. And I'm like, dude, you're like light years away from that. And <laughs> this is just Star Trek question. does Star Trek does a lot of that. I, mean, I love my Star Trek. I love my Star Trek. I just it's not it's not hard to take a to know what a planet and a star system is. Well I thought they were a little close to the problem to that too because <laughs> it was a great visual, but <laughs> Yes. Hello. 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 I uh, I have a question about media and media when you're building your worlds. Um, I mean, in real life, you can see that media is hugely influential in how we experience things and do things. Um, where do you draw the line? I just wondered if you could speak to that, because I feel like in your Persia acronym there, that that should also fall into it. How does media influence, especially in like science fiction, maybe not so much in fantasy, um, but whether it be newspapers, films, radio, everything is affecting things in this system, so I'll take you, it. You mean, like, yeah. culturally, what kind of media do they Yeah, use? culturally, I mean, how do you build into that, and how do you, how does that affect language, and does it homogenize it? Does it allow it to flourish in that way? I mean, if you could just sort of explore. 
Um. Well, seriously, I mean, even in fantasy, major question, do they have newspapers and printing presses or not? Because if they don't have a printing press, then communication becomes immensely more difficult. Or um, with a higher tech. Or higher tech than that. Or if, if, for instance, if you don't have the printing press, and you have a kingdom, lots of other kingdoms or something like that, and you have a wizard or a race of, say, telepaths. They're telepaths. You can have a telepath in this kingdom who's a spy who can do telepathy to the person in this kingdom, and they'll instantaneously know when this king is launching his army to come fight, so this kingdom will have six months' notice. So there's your story that this telepath, nobody knows this spy is a telepath, and that, therefore, the king thinks he's marching into this to take over a kingdom, and I'm not going to talk anymore because that's a cool idea. And I think it's <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a big book. You have 140 characters. <laughs> yes. Well, in, in media, in the sense of um, what is entertainment, do they just go to Shakespeare plays? Do they have puppet shows? Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of and. and if something horrible happens, how do they find out? That That's the thing that I ask myself. If something horrible happens, how is that news going to spread and that'll t sort of give you an idea? Because when horrible things happen mm -hmm. with us, it's like, you, I, I, like, even the most and also, I found out over Twitter before the news covered it. You know, you gotta think, how do they end up getting that communication? The rest of I, I remember watching the 9-11 coverage that morning, um, and everybody was just glued to it, watching it right then. Um, I remember when the Challenger blew up. I was hearing it on the radio, and then I was at work, and everybody ran into the break room because we were watching on the, on the TV. This is instantly, culturally, everybody knows this disaster happened. But if you're back in a fantasy world, nobody knows this. I mean, it, it, it would take a year before anybody got the news of 9-11. And by the time the news spread, it would be the, the game of telephone. I mean, there, there would be completely different stories all over the place. And we have, we have ways of verifying this we see right now. But fantasy is really, media is very, very difficult. Of course, you have the other problem in science fiction because people can manipulate media. Here, I've got this picture right there. Well, that doesn't mean it's true or not. I'm talking to others' questions. And I'm, I'm sorry, we're actually at 11.50 just now. Um, I know that our authors will be but, in the but other But the answer room. to your question is, Emma will read all of your manuscripts if you want to. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> my question. You'll be assigning next door with our authors. Thank you very much. May I ask you a question?